Okay, so welcome everybody again to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. So today's um, webinar will be presented by Rafael Mudafort. He is with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Idaho, uh, rather in Colorado. <laughs> and it will be uh, about strengthening development workflows by graphically communicating uh, elements of software design. And uh, Rafael is a senior research Research at the national again uh, NREL uh, National Wind Technology Center. He focuses on computational modeling of wind turbine and wind farm dynamics and controls. He has worked as a research software engineer for several wind energy uh, software packages, and uh, uh, he's currently involved in an effort to coordinate and elevate the quality of the laboratory's wind energy software. He is a recipient of the uh, 2023 Better Scientific Software Fellow uh, Fellowship. With that, Rafael, I'll stop my sharing and uh, I'll be momentarily posting the relevant links for the Q&A and also the feedback in the chat. Okay, thanks. I'll get started here. Okay, and uh, if you cannot see my title slide, just let me know. Good. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Raphael Monafort. I'm in my seventh year as a researcher in wind energy modeling at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And my role primarily involves the development uh, of research software for wind energy applications. I'll be talking through some processes that I feel have elevated the impact of my work. Uh, but before jumping into that, um, like Ozzy mentioned, I, I was uh, the recipient of the Better Scientific Software Fellowship for last year. So I wanna take a minute to acknowledge uh, that program, the BSSW Fellowship Program for sponsoring this work and uh, encouraging it from, uh, from the start. And so now I'll be presenting on strengthening development workflows by graphically communicating elements of software design. So to set the stage in my projects and projects adjacent to mine, I've noticed a pattern in funding and staffing uh, where either of these can be discontinuous or at least nonlinear over time. These plots aren't real data, but they are inspired by things I've seen in my projects. So on the top is funding levels over time. And this can change quite a bit um, on a quarterly or so basis in, in my area of the lab. And very closely related to funding is staffing on the lower plot. And this is just meant to communicate that people can come in and out of projects for a variety of reasons. And sometimes those are related to or correlated to funding levels, but also just workloads and, and shifts in research priorities. Uh, whatever the case, for uh, causing this situation, the consequence is that patterns um, on the consequence of these patterns on software development teams is that momentum and institutional knowledge can be lost, and ideas in the design of a particular software project can become implicit at best when they aren't explicitly communicated. Managing this is critical to the sustainability of many research software projects because continued funding and relevance in their field can directly depend on extendability. Before continuing to describe this situation, I'd like to take a second just to give you an idea of my background and why I've put some thought into this topic. Like I said before, I've been at NREL's National Wind Technology Center for a few years, and I've worked on the development and management of a number of software projects. A few of the ones that had the most impact on my opinions on scientific software development are listed here on this timeline. OpenFast is a whole turbine engineering fidelity simulation software. Um, an OpenFast derivative specific to airborne wind energy called KiteFast uh, was something we worked on for a couple of years. Uh, there's a steady state wind farm wake modeling software called Floris and an accompanying framework for comparing it and other similar software in the industry called WComp. Um, and those two I've worked on, well, Floris I've worked on the most, as you can see here on this timeline. Um, and so they, the, the combination of Floris and WCOMP really uh, had a, a large influence in kind of shaping my uh, my desire to work on 
this specific topic. So I'll refer back to those two software projects throughout this talk, but the details of both are mostly not important. Um, and finally, I've recently been involved in a project to analyze and coordinate the portfolio of wind energy software supported by the US Department of Energy. Um, and so this involves a software, this involves uh, generally software created at NREL, but also other labs. And this is called the WIDO software stack. Now, just in preparing this talk, I, um, I was looking at my GitHub statistics, uh, my, the breakdown of contribution type over the years. And I thought some, I thought it was interesting. I, I made this plot here on the bottom left, which is the breakdown of um, the type of contribution um, relative to the overall open source contribution. And the yellow and red lines are the, are the ones I wanna point out here, uh, just to say that the portion of commits that I've been making over time has clearly gone down, but the portion of code reviews has gone up. And I think, well, while that's a bummer because I like to write code, um, it is probably just a natural progression, uh, but it also, I think, really leads into this idea of, of communicating software design um, as a code reviewer. So with that in mind, I'll jump back into this, uh, the problem of software design and communicating it. So I said before that design can be implicit because we all make certain decisions on how to structure our software, but we don't always communicate it to other people or to ourselves. Here in particular, I'm showing some nice diagrams of typical design patterns. These are simple, very easy to read and readily available all over the internet. I've used some similar to these myself, plenty to describe my own software. And on the surface, this isn't bad and it's certainly better than nothing. But we often pick and choose a variety of these off the shelf patterns to suit our requirements. And we kind of smash them together into our projects. And it's this combination or this superposition of design patterns um, that's not easily or accurately represented by any one of these simple abstract diagrams. So some work is required on our end to represent our software more directly. And so what I'm suggesting here is that we invest time and attention into graphical representations of our software because it'll reduce the burden of integrating other developers. And I'll point out that when we're actively working on a software, we have a lot of intuition and knowledge about our work. But when we step away and come back to it later, we've lost a lot of that knowledge. So that new developer who needs to come up to speed on a particular project may well be ourselves in the future. By investing in these quality diagrams, we can turn a manual serial process into an offloaded parallel process. So it turns into like a one-to-one -one process into a one-to-many process. The diagram on the left here is uh, the diagram for the template design pattern which enables plugins or extensions into a core system. And I used uh, this or something very similar to this when I was thinking about uh, the design of a software of Floris, the software I mentioned earlier. Um, a key design feature of Floris is that wake modelers are able to add new mathematical formulation for wind turbine wakes by programming to a set of specific APIs. And then everything else is kind of integrated automatically through the system. Uh, the figure on the right outlines in red the classes that need to be extended in order to plug in a new wake model and give some context for how they fit into the big picture architecture. While the abstract diagram on the left was useful for me in the design of Floris, for other developers, it's far more useful to know the specifics of this within Floris so that they can get their job done. So what is there to communicate to begin with? Well, broadly, we should communicate design ideas and intent for some key components, such as the architecture at varying levels of fidelity, like system level architecture, package module or subroutine architecture, any general design principles throughout the architecture. So these are things like the balance of computational efficiency versus readability and things along those lines that are kind of more, along, more like design intent. Um, any data structure, design, or data flow, so any considerations that aren't extremely obvious, such as like uh, an intended memory layout, um, effect effective usage of our software. So it's more about communicating workflows. And then also things around the software, such as developer processes, developer coordination, um, and other processes like continuous integration. Now, this table, what I'm listing here is each of these areas in particular, but also um, that there are different stakeholders that will want to know different things about each of these topics. And it's important to identify who those stakeholders are and talk to them, communicate 
the thing that needs to be given uh, given their interests. Uh, before or if we're going to talk about software design, we need to talk about UML, which is the unified modeling language. And UML is a general purpose visual modeling language. It's intended to provide a standard way to visualize the design of a system. It's a family of graphical notations that enable constructing various types of diagrams to target different aspects of a software. UML is especially useful in object-oriented programming, but it's very relevant in any programming paradigm. There's even a form of UML specific to um, systems engineering called SysML. So the, the, the idea of this is actually quite versatile and useful in many contexts, but it was created for object-oriented software, and that's how I'll describe it here. UML itself is a set of specifications and it can be quite complicated. There's a whole infrastructure of stuff to describe the language, including meta models to describe models and meta meta models to describe the meta models. And all of this lives in this thing called the meta object facility, which is the diagram that I'm, that I'm showing here on the left. Um, in the end, you don't need to know the details of any of this to use UML, but I just wanted to point out that this stuff exists just so you just so you're aware. Um, and we'll we'll only talk about the diagram, the specific diagram models and their implementation. So just to make it clear, UML is unified modeling language, and it's a set of graphical objects that are assigned a meaning in a particular context. These graphical objects can be used to create diagrams to describe various aspects of a software system. And there's a whole ecosystem of tools, of developer tools, to help produce these diagrams both manually and automatically. And I'll talk through those later on. The UML is defined through these series of standards, but a much more approachable reference is UML Distilled. This is a book. Um, it's the, it, it aims to teach the 20% of UML that yields 80% of the benefit. And I think it does accomplish this goal. I've listed the table of context contents here just to illustrate the breadth of diagrams and topics that are covered. Uh, but some standout features of the book are a when to use section for each diagram. There's also a development processes chapter that goes into more detail than I will here on including this in workflows and especially with respect to collaborating in teams. Um, overall, it's relatively short and functions as both a reference and an explanation. Um, so there's really no read, no need to read it sequentially from front to back. I, I have it uh, pretty much always on hand or, or readily available and I I've highlighted a bunch of it. It's nice to, to be able to refer back to it as needed. Um, yeah, so I recommend to have it physically available, but there are also some PDFs floating around the internet. Uh, it's really cheap. And my point is just that uh, if you're interested in this topic, get it somehow, uh, whether it's digital or physical, and uh, yeah, and refer back to it. I think I think you won't regret it. So UML defines 14 types of diagrams and they're all covered in UML distilled. However, eight of the 14 are more broadly useful and those are listed here. Uh, these are very small and somewhat grainy pictures. So I don't intend for you to be able to, to read them. Um, I just wanna to call the names out quickly um, just so you've heard them once. So there's class diagrams, sequence diagrams, package diagrams, deployment diagrams, use case diagrams, state diagrams, activity diagrams, and interaction diagrams. Uh, many of these have overlap being scope, and they're most powerful when used in combination with each other to communicate a particular message to a particular audience. Here, I'll talk only about class and sequence diagrams in detail, and I'll also show some examples. So this is the class diagram model definition. These are basic constructs for describing a class and its relationship to adjacent classes. Um, this isn't the entire model, but it includes the most practical parts that you really need to use it. So the class, the class box itself allows you to show the properties of a class, the attributes and methods, as well as the visibility of the methods, whether they're public protected or private. Um, you can show function signatures and data types if you want as well. You're kind of free to, to add more detail here. Um, there's a similar notation for abstract classes. It's it's very similar, but it adds uh, italicized text in particular areas when you have um, an abstract method. 
Uh, there are specific line endings and relationship types that denote inheritance, aggregation, and composition. And generally, a line connecting two elements denotes any kind of relationship, and labels can be added to the line to give more information. Uh, something that you might add here are cardinality. So that's the numeric relationship between elements. Um, but you could you can make any note or add anything else that adds to the to the diagram. Before going into example uh, our examples of class diagrams, I want to talk about perspective. We can consider that there are three perspectives from which to construct a diagram. The conceptual perspective here on the left uh, contains broad, possibly abstract ideas that don't need to be represented that don't necessarily represent the implementation in code. This is often closer to the application domain of a software. Um, the specification perspective in the middle is primarily concerned with interfaces. So this represents the software at a high level and gives an idea about how objects connect to each other. And then, oh, sorry. And then the implementation perspective includes low level details possibly including private methods and low-level algorithms and, and that sort of thing. So this really describes kind of what's happening uh, at the unit level or at the class level. Each perspective is intended to communicate a different message to a different audience, and it's important to identify what and to whom you're communicating, and be sure to match that perspective in, in the diagrams. This idea of perspective in general, uh, I took from UML Distilled, so um, and there's uh, a longer description of it there, and so again, I highly recommend to, to refer to that. Um, so here's an example of a class diagram from one of my own projects, Wake Comp or W Comp that I, I mentioned earlier. And I'll use that same software for all the examples in, for all the class diagram examples. Uh, at this point, this is pretty much what you'd expect. This is a class in Wake Comp that I'm diagramming here on the right. Uh, you have the name of the class at the top, then the attributes are listed along with data types. Um, and then the methods with function signatures are in the last box at the bottom. To be honest, this isn't all that useful and on its own, it's redundant if you already have API documentation. Uh, here's a diagram for an abstract class and it's very similar in, except that it has italics in some places to denote these abstract methods. Again, doesn't add too much. Um, now here we're showing the inheritance relationship between the previous two diagrams. So it starts to get a little bit more useful um, so on the bottom was the first diagram that I showed, and then at the top was uh, the second one, just the one before this. And we're showing that the, this WCOMP Flores class inherits from WCOMP base. Uh, here, this is a lot of text, and that's because the attributes and methods in the, the subclass and the superclass are shown in both, even if they're, um, even if they're already available in the superclass. So it can be helpful to remove the repeated ones to improve readability. Um, and even here in this small example, this probably isn't still too insightful, but when you couple this with higher level diagrams, you start to build a good model of the architecture. And that's what I'm showing here. Here's a, a one step up view on WakeComp of the aggregation and composition. And so the class from the previous diagram, WCOMP Floris is uh, on the bottom left of this example. Um, and then there are uh, parallel objects that are uh, kind of on the same level of WCOMP Flores listed to the right. And you can see that they inherit from the same parent class and live on other classes. Um, um, they live alongside each other on these other classes. Now, in combination with the other lower level diagrams that I showed before, we can start to show um, uh, these different perspectives on um, yeah, kind of how these things play together and some of the implementation details as well. Uh, the previous diagrams are all from WCOMP, but I want to talk about another project that I've spent a lot of time on called Floris. Um, I'm showing here the evolution of the architecture of Floris over three major versions. On the left is Floris V2, and this is from this diagram is from back in 2018 or so. And the entry point to all of the data for, for the user is through this Floris object, which is at the very top. One thing you can immediately see um, is that there's a lot of objects between the top and the bottom. And by the way, the, the classes at the very bottom are kind of the things that hold all of the thing that's interesting to a user. So this 
large, this deep hierarchy became quite annoying when you had to type all these objects out, even, you know, even in, in something like VS Code where you could just hit tab to autocomplete, it got, it got quite cumbersome. Um, and it was just unnecessary. Um, we had auto-generated API documentation, but uh, even with that, it was difficult to for new users to come to this and piece together these object relationships if they didn't already have some idea about this. So not only was it cumbersome to type, but it was also a barrier to entry for, for new users. Um, so a major focus for us around 2020 and 2021 was to finally fix this in Flores V3, and that's the diagram in the middle. Um, so things aren't, uh, that there wasn't any like fundamental changes to the architecture, but we did collapse the hierarchy quite a bit. Um, so you can see we took the Turbin class, which was at the very bottom of the hierarchy in V2, and we put it all the way at the very top of the user interface in V3. Um, we realized it didn't even actually need to be a class, it was just a collection of functions. So we eliminated a redundant data structure and made all of that information much more accessible. And yeah, overall, it just saved a lot of typing. It was a lot more uh, user-friendly and a lot more approachable. Um, I'm showing here the diagram for the class diagram for V4, which is something that we just released uh, this past April. And the differences are a little bit more nuanced, but we brought um, the solver object also closer to the top and uh, generally refined the architecture. And I wanted to talk through this here because from from V2 to V3, it was probably the first time that I really felt the a strong need and tangible benefits of creating these diagrams. My colleagues and I had been talking about how the current architecture was painful at that time, but it was difficult to allocate the funding to do something about it because, of course, in the research environment, allocating funding in one thing means you're not going to have you're not going to be able to do another thing. Um, so, in talking about it, it was one thing, but when we finally had an image. Um, and an image of the current state and then the, an image of the uh, prototype of what we wanted it to be, it was much easier to explain to other people who weren't spending their day-to-day -day using Flores why this was a problem and what we were going to do to solve it. Ah, those are the two turbine boxes that moved and then solver box that moved. <laughs> okay, now I'll move on to the sequence diagram model. Uh, on the model, uh, on this model, the the sequence uh, of the of a process or time proceed downward, and that's what uh, that's what we're showing here with this arrow on the left. Um, objects or actors can be defined as elements that play a role in a process, and these are defined uh, kind of at the top of of each of these vertical lines. These actors interact with one another to complete a process. They can, oh, um, sorry, these are the these are the actors here, and this is how they interact with one another to, um, to complete a process. They can send messages or commands to each other, and the lifetime of the objects can be made clear. An important feature of sequence diagrams is the focus of control, and this is the box on a, on a particular line to denote which object is in command of the process at a particular point. These describe, in general, these describe processes or algorithms in sequential steps, but you can also capture loops and parallel steps, and I'll show that in the examples next. Here's an example of implementation of a sequence diagram from Flores, which uh, I've talked about uh, a minute ago. In essence, Flores calculates the velocity of the wind coming into each wind turbine, accounting for the impact of any upstream turbine wakes. Um, since Flores is a steady state analytical tool, we don't need to know the velocity in the space between the turbines. We only need to know the velocity um, at, at the turbine in the rotor swept area. So to do this, we place a series of points within the swept area. And this is this diagram at the very top, uh, these red points with the blue circle. Um, yeah, so we, we place us in one case, a square grid of points just within uh, the swept area of the turbine, and we calculate the wind, the wind speed coming in there, um, given any upstream turbines. Um, and then we use that to calculate uh, the thrust of this turbine so that we can calculate its effect on the wind and any downstream turbines. Uh, 
that that whole process. So we have to we iterate from upstream to downstream on these turbines, and that whole process is captured here in this sequence diagram, um, and the the three plots on the on the right. And so those are showing the wind speed coming into each turbine, um, and then you see that the leading turbine has the highest wind speed, and then it slows down as you go through. Um, yeah. So first we do, just to kind of walk you through this process, first we do, we create a bunch of data, get any, get any of the user inputs and kind of configure Floris. And then we loop over each turbine and add uh, its effect on the wake uh, to kind of a, a global data structure and then continue on that way. So though this scheme is sufficient and uh, it's fast enough in kind of the core use case of Floris, which is calculating the, the energy production of a wind farm given a set of atmospheric conditions. Um, it's not very satisfying because we don't have any pretty pictures of the wake. We only get the information on, um, on the points on the swept area of the rotor. So generally for our own model development and uh, kind of deeper studies, it's nice to be able to solve for points within the wind or in between the wind turbines in the whole flow field. And so for that case, we have another type of solver algorithm that leverages the first one. Um, whenever someone needed to make a change here, I, I was getting a lot of questions about how it worked because this particular part of the code is verbose and not very easily readable. So instead of refactoring the code, since that has its own consequences, I spent some time making this diagram to explain how the two solvers relate. Here you can see that the this full flow solver, as we call it, uses the first solver um, as an inner loop and everything else is fundamentally the same. So the part of this diagram that is not blue is the exact same as the previous diagram. But then I added this blue part to show that there's this additional loop here that just uses the other parts. And there is one kind of key component of this um, that needs to be communicated uh, to kind of connect the two solver algorithms. But it's easy to add that note in words. And I've done that here in this yellow box. Just to drive this point home, here's a screenshot of the three unique solver functions of three of the unique solver functions of the seven total in Floris. And I don't expect you to be able to read any of this, but I just wanted to show that even zooming out, you can see there's a similar structure in all of them. Um, there's some setup and then there's a loop over each turbine. And like I said before, there's a dependency of some of, from some of these solver functions to others. And this code is relatively neat and well-organized but it's just a lot to dig through um, to try to understand how all these things relate to each other. So in the end, providing an entry point for Flores developers to understand this particular area without having to look at Python code really saved me as a, the core developer and maintainer of this code. It really saved me a lot of time um, in having to explain all these things on a one-off basis uh, and it improved the extendability of our software. So here's the two, um, diagrams just for side-by-side -side comparison. So you can see that they're very similar, except with this added detail on the right. While the sequence diagrams are extremely useful to, um, to the software itself, the processes around the software are also important to define and can be expressed with these diagrams. I use this one in particular in the developer's guide for one of my projects. Uh, it illustrates the process and expectations that the core development team has for external contributors. Um, so here I've listed community developer and maintainer as actors, and each step relates to a concrete thing that should happen along the development uh, process, such as create a design document on GitHub discussions or submit a pull request for code review. And while it's basic, it has been helpful to set these expectations ahead of time. And by putting it in a diagram instead of in words, it allows uh, external contributors coming into this project to kind of have a map of where they are, um, a visual map of where they are within the process. And it it really does good, a good job of setting the setting expectations on both ends. Now, UML is a good framework, but remember that there are other things to communicate that aren't covered by UML. Some, just some things that don't fit into UML are Git flow, and this is a really popular famous diagram that's floating around the internet here on the left, any kind of data IO or memory layout um, and, or mathematical or computational concepts 
And here on the right, this is from NumPy on the um, array broadcasting documentation that I thought was really clear. So these are all really important things that don't have uh, an analogous diagram in UML. Um, yeah, so I, all this to say just that uh, I think UML is important, but don't feel limited by it. And I pretty much always use uh, UML and other diagrams within the context of written documentation. Hey, Rafael, uh, three questions for you. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, I meant to, <laughs> I meant yes. to stop and ask for questions. Okay, so can UML be used to model new features of C++ like concepts or modules? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite flexible. Um, I'm not sure if uh, these are specific, like specific language features. Is that, is that the question? I, I'm having worked in C++ in a number of years, so I'm not up to date. But well, I, I, I'll ask the, the participant to elaborate on that so that, uh, so we can address that later. So the, okay. the next question, are there any, are there any code metrics that can be compute, computed from UML, 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 sorry. <laughs> Are there any code metrics? Yes. Um, okay, so generally UML, it, UML diagrams are, you can auto-generate them and I'll, I'll talk through that in a second. Um, but the process of auto-generating them uh, is usually provides far too much information. So it's usually far more practical to use the auto-generated diagrams as a starting point and then reduce them. And I, I say that just to say that there are these tools to do this static analysis of your code. And that's where you might get some of these metrics. Um, so number of times you're calling a function, um, any kind of static analysis, you won't get any kind of runtime diagnostics, but there are of course profiling tools for that kind of thing as well. But, uh, but yeah, just statically, you can certainly get uh, some metrics and, and kind of doing that static profiling, but that's separate from UML itself. UML is really intended to communicate uh, kind of the, from human to human. So, um, uh, so yeah, I don't think that would, I don't think that would be kind of within the scope of UML, but you certainly would get it along the process. The last question for for now: what what tool did you what tool did you use to draw the diagrams, especially the the sequence diagram? I'm not going to tell you yet because it's coming up. All right, <laughs> coming up there very quickly. <laughs> okay, there uh, there are two interesting comments there in the chat for the people like to take a look later. So yes, please, uh, Rafael, uh, keep going. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't stop in, and thanks for stopping me. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'll talk about, uh, that That was all kind of setting the stage. What is UML? What can it do? Or what can you do with it? Um, but now I want to talk about what this means to us as research software engineers or software developers more practically. So taking this um, idea of diagramming and communicating elements of design and doing it in the development workflow. Uh, before getting super practical, I want to just call out this idea of documentation-driven development. And this is the idea that documentation should be a first-order product of software, very similar to how with test-driven development, we say that tests should be a first-order product of software. In fact, uh, I think many of us would probably share the opinion that, um, that writing the code is not the hard part. It's showing that it's correct, and then also communicating what you've done to somebody else so that they can pick up what you put down. All of that is non-trivial and extremely important, especially in the research context. Um, so yeah, so with that in, with that said, I wanna just call out this ni really nice organization called Write the Docs. And they, in my mind, are kind of like the thought leaders in this area. They have a conference, they put out a lot of good content. Um, I, list, I listed this definition of uh, docs as code from their website. Um, so you can kind of read that if you'd like, but I recommend just going to their website and engaging with them. And I'll also add that um, I think documentation-driven development is especially important for research software. I believe that an idea is almost irrelevant until it's been communicated to somebody else. And if we want our software and all the work embedded in it to live on within research cycles, we have to actively and explicitly communicate about the ideas that are in our code. 
So I, I really just see this as something very fundamental to uh, the research software environment. Now, going back to a previous slide, I have to admit that I lied here. I created all of the examples using automated tools and a little bit of cleanup, but uh, because I wanted to communicate um, what I wanted to communicate. So I, so I did this cleanup, except in one instance. In this one that I'm showing here, I completely changed the diagram because the results that I got back from the automated tool that I used told me something that I didn't expect. In other words, I had misunderstood the own, my own code, the code that I designed. Um, so I changed the diagram to match the mental model that I had, even though it was incorrect. And I'm currently working on modifying the code to match uh, this model. So all this to say that, uh, again, just like with software testing, it's all too easy to accidentally fool yourself into thinking you know what's going on with your software, especially when you're the one that created all of it. So to check yourself and save a ton of time, I suggest to use uh, so, uh, these automated tools. Um, I suggest that we treat diagrams just like other software infrastructure, incorporate it into the development process through documentation-driven development, build tools and infrastructure to generate diagrams uh, and trust them, and leverage automation to let computers do the heavy lifting. There's a whole ecosystem of tools for this, and here are a few in particular that I use. Doxygen is a static code analyzer to create diagrams primarily for C, C++, and Fortran. And GraphViz is a library used to create images from graph-based data structures. Um, and I really only use it within the context of Doxygen, but it's worth pointing out because it is a powerful library in itself. PyReverse, which is part of the PyLint package, is a static code analyzer for Python. It's similar in essence to Doxygen and, and you can use it fairly similarly. And then there's Mermaid, which is a domain specific language for diagramming. And uh, all these tools are very scriptable, very easy to incorporate into an existing documentation framework. And I'll talk through each of them a bit. Um, going back to Doxygen, this is the static code analyzer for C or C++ code. I'll show how it's used. Um, and I'm using it here uh, to create the, the um, API do uh, documentation for this software called AMRX, which is a uh, adaptive mesh refinement library. Um, so yeah, I'll show the commands here. So with a, an admittedly rather long config file, though the defaults are pretty good, you can automatically generate API documentation for your project. So after you run the doxygen command, you get a ton of output to the screen. And then a folder with HTML files is created. Should be coming up here. So then if you open that, you get the doc site. And that's this. Um, and if you've enabled it, you can include class inheritance diagrams as well as other types of diagrams. And that's what's showing here on the right. So the, the screenshot on the left is the AMRX uh, doc site it's just the home screen. So Doxygen gives you this really nice home page. Um, and it's it's kind of first order use case is this uh, the API documentation. But if you enable it and you have GraphViz installed, you can generate these uh, inheritance and, and module diagrams on the right. Um, and the, you can get all of this without any additional uh, markup of your code. It's just doing a static analysis. Um, so very little barrier to entry once you get past that configuration step. The next one I'll talk about is Mermaid. And I mentioned before that it's a domain-specific language. It's it's actually a JavaScript library. Uh, render or It's a JavaScript library primarily used to render its own domain-specific language. Um, so from my perspective, I see it as a, this kind of language. Um, but in essence, it is this JavaScript library. And probably the most important feature of Mermaid is that it's supported in so many developer tools. Most critically for me are VS Code, GitHub, most documentation frameworks, and this note-taking app I use called Joplin. Um, I searched for all the Mermaid diagrams in my Joplin notes, and here's a subset of them. So this was just kind of fun for me to see over the, over the years just how much I've used um, mermaid, especially within this context. And since it's text-based, you can describe your diagrams through text and include them alongside your code in version control, so in Git. 
Um, and to answer the question from before, this is what I used to create um, most of all of the diagrams that I showed before. Um, so I generated them with another tool that I'll show next, um, and then I refined them. But but the generation, the, the language in which they were described is is mermaid. Um, okay, now I just want to show the GitHub integration. So I'm showing here uh, how I was working on this project where we had this multi-lab collaboration and we were, there was a lot of conversations around how to structure the architecture of a project. So I'm showing here how I proposed a software architecture to this new project through a GitHub discussion using Mermaid. Um, so on the, the screenshot on the left is uh, the discussion itself. This was uh, from October of last year, but I just went back and, and uh, went to edit the discussion. So you can see the text input on the left. Um, and so you can start to get a sense for how, how Mermaid kind of how the language and the syntax looks. But then GitHub automatically for any GitHub product that uses the GitHub flavor of Markdown, will render Mermaid um, in the website itself. So you get these visual diagrams for very little work once you're familiar with uh, the, mermaid, um, the mermaid syntax itself. itself. Super helpful. Uh, here I'm referring, I'm uh, showing again something very similar, but how it's embedded in Sphinx-based documentation. So this is specifically within that WCOMP project that I had mentioned earlier. On the left is the doc string for that WCOMP Flores class that I've been kind of going back and forth or using as an example. Um, and within the doc string, I have a class diagram here. And then that's what's shown on the left. So this is actually the source code for the class itself. And then on the right is the, the documentation live on the internet. So, so um, yeah, this is rendered automatically through Sphinx using the mermaid JavaScript library. And by the way, it's it's built through GitHub pages. So all this, after I describe it in the doc string, everything else, of course, there's a little bit of con configuration, but everything else happens on its own. Um, mermaid is easily the most critical tool for me in, and has really enabled me to, to generate more and much more sophisticated diagrams over time. PyReverse is uh, a command line tool that does static code analysis of Python projects. It's super helpful, especially to create a starting point for you to build off of for your diagrams. You have quite a bit of control over the levels of fidelity of the diagrams, and it exports to a variety of formats, including Mermaid. It's really nice, though it can be a little bit clunky. And here I'll demonstrate the usage of PyReverse just quickly. Um, this is within Floris and uh, so if you navigate to a directory uh, of your source code and issue this command, and here I've said to output the diagram in mermaid format, which is MMD for short, um, it takes a little bit of time to do the static code analysis, but then it generates the mermaid code. And then there's a VS code extension to render that live. Now, for some reason, it doesn't work right out of the box, but because I'm familiar with Mermaid, I know if you just delete part of it, you get this really nice uh, package diagram that, is, like I said, is a really good starting point. That's probably too much information than you need, but um, you can start there and delete many of it. Now, you can also do this for one class at a time, um, and that's what I'm showing here. And then you get, again, this uh, class diagram. Uh, and in this case, this is a very simple class. For any kind of very sophisticated class, you'll get a lot of information. But uh, yeah, it's helpful to, to generate this and then go back and delete whatever it is that you don't want. PyReverse does have some nice config options. And you do you can control the levels of fidelity in the module uh, diagrams and, and that sort of thing. So, so it is super helpful. Uh, and by the way, this is exactly what I did for both the Florist and the WComp. Uh, documentation. So these are also both live. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that um, yeah, it can be really a really helpful tool to get a lot of information out there quickly. Um, here's a little bonus that I didn't list before. I recently discovered this tool called AppMap. 
which is a, uh, a tool that can create sequence diagrams automatically by running a process by running a process with the app map wrapper, which is like a, they have different language wrappers. Um, you can get these really nice diagrams with a ton of detail. Um, you can also export these diagrams uh, to various formats. I don't think they have mermaid yet, but they do have other formats in this kind of ecosystem of diagram uh, of UML diagram languages is quite rich and, and there's a lot of crossover between different formats. So you can kind of easily go from one format to another. Um, I haven't played with this too much, but I am really excited to, to see, uh, yeah, what kind of value this can continue to add to my work. So to summarize, I'll just su I'll suggest that we as a community adopt graphical methods of communication to talk directly about the design of our software because it can increase the sustainability of our work. UML gives us the constructs to do it, and I suggest that you get the book UML Distilled for reference, and there's an ecosystem of open source software that gives us the tools to do it. And we can put all this into practice by considering documentation as code through documentation-driven development. And there's just one more thing I want to say quickly. All of this for me was inspired by the feeling that my colleagues and I do a lot of great work that often goes um, unnoticed or it can be kind of easily trivialized by uh, some of the researchers that we work with who use what we what we create. And I think this comes from uh, that in software design, when it works well, it looks easy. Um, and in talking about this with my wife, she's an architect, a, a buildings architect, not a software architect. We realized that in her world, they have this whole system of communication to discuss, understand, and critique the design, not just the outputs, the constructed building, but actually the design itself. They've essentially made it that so that the design is an output. And I certainly don't propose that the research software community should go that far. But I do hope that by explicitly communicating about the design of our software, that we can bring more attention to all of the great work that's embedded in research software and that in turn enables great science. So I want to thank you all for taking the time to, to listen to all of this and for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions, but also please reach out if you're interested in talking through any of this more. Uh, you can reach out to me directly. That's my email address. Um, that Rafmudaf is my GitHub handle is also um, the, the end of my LinkedIn uh, URL. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, yes, there are some questions here for you. There is a long one, actually. I'm going to break it. Two questions. Uh, how does document documentation of requirements fit into the document-driven process? The emphasis on design, but at least rougher requirements, should precede this. Yeah, of course. Uh, this this emphasis was on design. I mean, there's a whole process of of developing software and designing the architecture of the code itself is just one aspect of that. I would say that requirements, uh, certainly listing requirements, should be done probably before you get to this architectural or like schematic design of the software, um, just so you know what it is that you're doing, and and that will probably well, should inform uh, the the architectural design. Um, just as a quick anecdote, I mentioned this whole redesign effort that we did with Floris from V2 to V3. And that, that deep architecture that we landed on in V2 was because we didn't lay out requirements before doing the design. So I, it, it's my, I'll take the blame on that. I, it was, I did all of the V2 and V3 design, um, but I didn't think about I didn't take the time to think about how Floris was going to be used in the context it was going to be used before I created all the data structures. And it turned out that I created them pretty much exactly wrong for uh, performance. And so once we realized that, of course, for V3, we, uh, we did scope out some requirements. And then we developed those architecture diagrams to, uh, to meet those requirements. OK, so how could traceability between the requirements and design be handled. Likely changes should be likely changes should be documented before starting the design since they govern the design. Yeah, that's right. I th I think they should be. I think the you should have your design intent um, stated up front 
And there's kind of, there's actually this word for this in the design community called party. It's kind of like the, the driving design or the, the driving, uh, the driving motivation or thing that it is that, that you're really trying to do. I think all of that should be identified ahead of time. Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand the connection between changes and, um, yeah, changes and these diagrams. Can you restate that, Ozan? Uh, okay, so like likely changes, likely changes should be documented before starting the design since they govern the design. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm going to say that I'm reading the questions, but a, a little bit later, I'll invite the participants to ask questions to you directly. Okay. okay. Uh, so let's uh, move to the, okay. So what advice do you have on design principles? Composition over inheritance? Rec uh, recommend, do you have any patterns to, to, uh, rec to recommend concerning design patterns? I mean, yeah, the question of composition over inheritance is... Well, I think a question, it seems like maybe these can be kind of stylistic sometimes. And uh, it, seem, it seems like at least on the internet, it, what I've seen is that kind of the conversation will shift from one to the other and kind of bounce back and forth. Um, I'm hesitant to recommend any particular uh, recommendation there, I like anything specific, but I, I do recommend to have a design process. Um, I don't know if it's gonna show if it's blurred, but like I am very partial to doing things on paper first before I do any kind of code. Um, so I draw diagrams uh, myself just to like make sure that I understand how things are gonna fit together. Um, something that we did for the V4 redesign in Flores was we, um, I had uh, a group of my colleagues uh, pretend that there were all these API endpoints for Flores and write their own script, assuming that um, these things could work and then kind of let me fill in the back end, like let me do the engineering to make those things work. And so I probed them uh, individually and got their input on, this was kind of like a dreaming session, like, okay, if you don't have to worry about the complexity of making it happen, tell me what it is that you'd want. Um, and so I collected all that feedback and then was able to uh, aggregate that into something that, you know, it didn't didn't solve all the problems, but it was certainly highly influenced by that. So I, I guess all this to say just to, I highly recommend to have a design process and um, especially use words and use diagrams to communicate what you're doing. Like, uh, I think it's a smell test that if you can't tell somebody what you're doing and have them repeat it back accurately, that you probably haven't developed the idea enough. Um, so it's probably not super tight. So yeah, that's my recommendation on software design. Um, and I think, yeah, on these, on these more specific questions, especially like these Python things on um, uh, composition versus inheritance, I think establishing the requirements up front is really important because it, that really does can drive that and uh, you don't always know what you don't know, um, but trying to answer those questions and reduce that uncertainty around how your software is going to be used, the computing systems is going to be on the, the types of data and size of data that um, that it'll be using, all that's really important to take into consideration beforehand. There's a question here that I think you have already answered. It's related to the configure, configuring a GitHub to use a mermaid to render the diagrams. I think we've already covered that. You don't have to do anything. You, you, I mean, you, there's a gate, uh, just like with any markdown, you do the three ticks. I think it actually can be any number of ticks and then curly bracket and type mermaid, um, just like you would do uh, like syntax highlighting for in GitHub markdown, it's the same. Another question, will these tools work with code that uses a mixed language program? For example, mm. a mix of a mix of C, C plus C plus plus C Fortran, and with calls to external libraries. Yeah, so Doxygen I've used in OpenFast, and that uh, that is that does have some mixed language, and I'm I'm fairly confident it does work. Um, yeah, that's a primarily Fortran code. 
but it had some C APIs in it. Yeah, again, I'm I'm 95% sure it works with mixed language programming or mixed language software, but I haven't used, I haven't tried this in any other context uh, with mixed languages. PyReverse is probably Python specific. Um, but I, my, I just kind of like quickly perusing this space uh, a few weeks ago, there, there are tools for other languages, kind of each language ecosystem has its set of tools. Okay, so now I think that's all we had here in the Q&A and &A the, the chat the questions. There are some comments. Uh, I'd like to invite this, the participants to unmute if there are any other questions here. Uh, in particular, I think there was that long question that I don't know, may, maybe I failed to convey the right <laughs> message to Rafael. Uh, uh, so it, yeah, the participants, please feel free to unmute and ask questions directly to Rafael, if any questions left. I can't see, I think I can't see uh, some parts of the chat, unfortunately. Okay. But uh, what I did, I took the questions in the, uh, in the chat and pa pasted into the Q&A for you to, uh, to answer late, you know, later. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. That sounds good. And I'll paste the comments too. Okay. You know, other questions from the participants? There is one here, Alfred. What is the incentive for researchers to communicate their research well to known experts? Well, that's, that's a great <laughs> question. Uh, uh, I'll just give, I, I shouldn't speak for the research, the group of researchers in general, but I'll give my opinion. And it's that, um, or I should say, I'll give my, the reason I want to communicate my work to non-experts. And it's specifically within the context of being a research software engineer. I think it's kind of easy for researchers to, like, we all can write code. You know, we, we've all done this in school. And um, it's kind of easy to assume that if you can write a script or write a few lines of code, then you can also build complex and elegant software. And I just don't think that's the case. Um, and so communicating like actually what is it that I do as a software developer? Like what is it that you're not seeing because Floris works well, so you don't have to see all these things on the back end. Communicating that enables me to communicate, well, what I've done. And um, more recently, I've been trying to pass on some of the responsibilities of Floris and uh, kind of let it become what it will. And by communicating the, this is what I was getting at before in the beginning, by communicating the design explicitly, I'm able to pass that on without everybody, you know, without future developers coming in and unknowingly breaking the party that I've established. You know, that, that plugin framework that I put in place, that's really central. And so if you change one of the APIs, then you've just, you've just broken uh, like a core tenet of Floris. Um, but if you, if that weren't in the documentation through a diagram and through text, then you know m many people wouldn't know that because it's kind of hard to to figure this out by just reading the code. So that to me is the incentive. I think we still have a minute here for uh, some time for a couple of questions. Can you elaborate on how receptive your management and your customers, colleagues, have it been to your use of these tools? Yeah, to my use of these tools, people have been quite receptive. I think people appreciate, I've, I've heard directly that people appreciate uh, the this visual communication and that it, that it does help. I think I'll re, I'll like elaborate a little bit on the question and maybe rephrase it to how receptive have colleagues been on generating their own diagrams. That's uh, a bit more difficult at NREL and at um, the, my center, the NWTC where I work, we have a kind of a subgroup of people who kind of consider themselves RSCs. And there's been uh, quite a bit of engagement there and adoption of these tools there. I, I, I probably at least once a week, I come across somebody using like a new mermaid diagram that I hadn't seen before. And that, that always makes me happy to see it being used. Um, but yeah, for people whose primary product of research is not software, it's you know, maybe publication or something else. That's a little bit more difficult, but um, 
I've tried to kind of uh, do the heavy work for them. So like if someone's scoping out a new feature in a project um, and I know that the documentation for that project doesn't already exist, rather than expecting them to create all the documentation from scratch, um, I'll try to put it in place kind of like in the current state and then let them add their scope. I think maybe that didn't make sense. So sorry about that. But uh, yeah, if you want to talk about this a little more, I'm, I'm happy to, to have that conversation. Final, final question. Uh, uh, to what extent do you use these tools when writing up your research? Do you oh, see yeah. them as a do you see them as only useful for software papers or are they also useful for domain science publications? Yeah, no, I, so Mermaid, I think is not that pretty. So uh, I try not to, I'm like selective about when I use that in a publication, but I have been diving more into the configuration of Mermaid um, and through that. So actually I, I uh, was just at a conference that required a paper as well. And I, and I, most of them um, that weren't, you know, plotting data, most of the figures were mermaid. So yeah, I, I definitely do use it uh, in academic publications, but I try to try to like uh, refine it a bit. Um, you also don't have a lot of control over where the boxes land with mermaid. So um, yeah, so that can be challenging too, especially when you're just trying to navigate space on a page. Yeah, okay. I, I agree that uh, LaTeX and and other and like associated tools are probably better for publication. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you all the participants for joining us today. Uh, we uh, get more information about our uh, the next webinar in the series. Thank you all. Thank, thank you for you the everybody. comments and thank you for the questions.